All right, good morning, good evening, good night. Another episode of the Nifty Q Show. We're interviewing founders, leaders, influencers, badass people around the space. I got one with me here, Joe Payne. He's created and is creating Society of the Hourglass, a project that is very close to our hearts as they are the sponsors for this month's episode or network uh, as well. So excited to sit here with Society of the Hourglass. Joe, how are you doing today, my man? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Awesome. So co-founder and community lead uh, here at Society of the Hourglass. Not the, the, the combination I see a lot on the channel. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your background kind of before you found yourself in crypto, how you found yourself kind of in this community role and founding Society of the Hourglass. Yeah. Um, so it, it's been kind of a, an interesting journey to get here. So I, my background is in design. That's what I've done for the majority of my professional career, uh, design and operational leadership. I was COO at a tech agency for a while, um, led design before that. Uh, I got pretty heavily into NFTs back in the summer. Um, so still, like, I'm still learning a lot, right? I'm like six months into this journey, which is, I think, 100 years in NFT time. But um, I dove really deep into a couple of communities as a collector. And so as we started talking about what we wanted this project to look like, um, I, I had kind of the most experience in this group of co-founders kind of understanding what the space looked like, what those dynamics were. And so as we were kind of talking about like, what do we want to do? What are our, what are our strengths? What are our gaps? This felt like a really natural place for me to slot into um, I, I'm in a position right now where I have a lot of time that I can focus, you know, kind of jumping in and engaging in Discord and on Twitter and things like that. And, um, you know, on, on top of that, I I've also have kind of founded and run community organizations in the past. I've um, had a kind of design centric creative community locally here where I live that I ran with a buddy for a long time. So this dynamic of, you know, kind of rallying people around a shared interest and, and finding ways to get engaged together and, and just have fun was something that I've, I've done for a while. Yeah. I want to jump into how NFTs kind of play into that community building aspect, right. And how they're kind of unlocking this value that wasn't there before. Uh, yeah. but I do want to jump into society of the hourglass and just get a quick overview of what you're doing for the project and what you guys are building there for people that are just brand new. You guys really just announced a little while ago, uh, so really excited to see your growth in that time period. Uh, but you guys are building a community for the future of entertainment upcoming January 4th drop 8,888 citizens, competitors, and Nigel's and your That's mission right. bringing <laughs> web three to Hollywood through an animated series, which I think is a, a really dope concept to have the community be being built uh, and kind of growing and growing this animated series with them as opposed to for them. Uh, but yeah. I'll let you talk about it, man. What is society of the hourglass for those people who are just hearing about it now. Yeah. So, I mean, what you just gave a really great overview. Um, I mean, we're, we're not looking at this as just an NFT drop where we're, we really are building a web three entertainment brand that happens to be starting with an NFT drop. We're, we're looking at kind of the power of the technology and community as a, a unique way to approach the space. Uh, when we got started, we knew that we wanted to do more than just a collection. Like we wanted to bring that experience into the real world. Um, so we're also doing an illustrated seek and find book, which uh, our, our, our lead artist is a really, really talented illustrator. He's done books like this in the past. Like we, we had the experience on the team to bring that to life. The animated series idea was one that we had talked about, but not something we necessarily wanted to tackle kind of right out of the gate because like that that's ambitious right that's a big thing a lot of people talk about doing it very few it, it, us included have the experience on the core team to like know how to go make that happen um, so kind of by chance and through relationships we got connected with who is our partner now jump cut media um, they fell in love with what we were doing and, and this is a team that like has brought shows to life for Netflix and Disney and others. Like they know the space, they have a mission to bring web three to Hollywood. And so as we started talking about just the potential for storytelling and I'll, I'll get into kind of the narrative of the society here in a second, but um, it just felt like a really natural fit. And so we decided to team up and they're helping lead the community through this process of 
making a direct contribution and impact on kind of the narrative foundation of the society of the hourglass. We're going to use that to create a, a series handbook and, and write the story that is eventually going to be a, a pitch and a proposal for an animated series. And, and then we've got the connections in the network now to actually go and make that happen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're talking about what that process looks like. And, and this is, this is a new way to approach this, right? So we're also kind of coming at this from an entrepreneurial standpoint and knowing like, we're going to have to iterate and pivot as we go. We're going to learn things We're we're kind of casting a vision, but not getting super locked in on any specific thing, because if we need to pivot, we will, and we'll do that with the community's input and kind of help lead them through that. Um, but the story itself is going to be super fun. Um, so you, you were mentioning some of the character types, the general idea is that the society, the hourglass is this, kind of omnipresent organization that's always existed throughout time. Um, and they've kind of operated behind the scenes of reality, helping kind of bring about technological innovation, different waves throughout time. Uh, so the competitors are the people that have learned about the society and kind of been recruited and invited to come try to join the society. So all of our main characters are famous historical figures and we're really focusing on um, a really diverse cast of characters. Like we want to tell stories that aren't always focused on and told. So we've got a really, really interesting band of characters that are, are going to create a really rich narrative. Um, but at some point along their journey, these portals and time get stuck open. And so people from all different places and eras start pouring through. So we've got cyberpunk cowboys and, you know, people from the ice age winding up and, uh, you know, ancient Rome and things like that. So we are the generative part of our collection is going to have all of these really fun time swapped characters. And from there, like that's kind of where the community storytelling comes into play as we establish this kind of core narrative arc. Now it's up to the community alongside us and jump cut to figure out like, what are the specific stories being told from that? And, and that's where it gets really fun when you think about the animated series and how that impacts books and other forms of storytelling, um, you know, and then, and then we're also focusing outside of the entertainment side. And like, we, we believe that there's going to be a massive wave of people coming into NFTs that don't have any idea what the technology is or what it looks like. So we want to play a role in onboard and educate them. Yeah. Um, we're going to put the books in schools and give them to, you know, educational nonprofits in addition to our holders. So we've got this really multi-pronged strategy to both educate non-board creators and collectors into NFTs, as well as create this entertainment property that kind of weaves this idea of the past and the future together in some really fun ways. Yeah, I think we're, I don't want to get ahead of myself here because we have a conversation to have about Hashku, right? Which is this umbrella yeah, yeah. That, that essentially has Society of the Hourglass underneath it. Uh, but I want to talk about that community narrative of building, you know, Web3 to Hollywood. Like that's a big statement. And the yep. fact that you need to do that with the community brings me back to that quote of if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, <laughs> go together. And I think right. that is going to be something that's going to be important for you guys down the road. Certainly you have to set up all of these different things though in the short term. You said you had a town hall meeting uh, planned recently. You, know, you also have what conversations with Zeneca, Josh on. Can you take me on the, the vision or the journey of building this community uh, so that it can contribute, right? Because voter apathy, uh, apathy in general, community apathy, if you will, is tough. You know, it's, it's tough to create that. It is. Yeah. And, you know, and, I mean, the good thing is, if, if you want to call it that, is that we expect some of that, right? Like th this, we know that this is not an easy thing. We're, we're not under any preconceived notions that we're just going to sail into success trying to do something like this just because it sounds fun. Um, it's going to be a lot of really hard work. And I think that's where entrepreneurial grit and our collective experience. So we're all, we're all doxxed. Most of the team is entrepreneurs. Like we've been through that process before of kind of starting with nothing and having to figure out how to build and scale and bring people along and, and kind of enroll advocates in that process. And that, and that's real regardless of whether or not they play a direct like contributory role in what you're building. They, they happen to be doing that for us. So we're, we're testing mechanics even right now before we launch around how we kind of 
source ideas and direction from the community. Um, we've got a mint pass collection out right now. Um, so we do have a small holder group and we're letting them kind of be the ones to vote on what the community input gets kind of what we commit to Canon essentially. Mm. Um, so we're, we're electing some new stewards for our collection, which is the members of the society, of the hourglass. So right now, even before launch, we've got our community kind of involved in this process of, thinking about how introducing this new character might play out in stories and in the collection, because these are going to be one of ones in the actual drop on January 4th. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting uh, way to go about it. We're going to start by establishing what's called like a, a handbook or a writer's Bible. So this is what, um, you know, studios and writers will kind of operate based off of as they go trying to create stories within this world. So the community is going to help influence and write character arcs, backgrounds, help us establish the lexicon of terminology and kind of establish core foundational components. And from there, anybody can start to create stories within the society of the hourglass. Like we, we want to protect the brand and build something really valuable, but we also want to do it in a way that makes it accessible and puts it in as many people's hands as possible. Yeah. I'm super interested in this point because what you're saying is like, we want the community to help out, but we understand that we need to protect our brand as well. So where, where do you draw the line as a, as a creator, as a brand, because we see this happening across yeah. web three, it's like community owned, but we also need a, a lead, right? Like there's this weird balance that needs to be played out. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, I think we're, we're having all those same conversations, right? And I, I don't know that we we have all of those answers. I think there are some interesting um, kind of scenarios playing out in the space right now that that have implications in different ways. I, I mean, with especially with like the artifact and Nike yeah, news yesterday. And it's like, oh man, that has huge implications on what people maybe thought they could do with the IP. Um, so we're, be, we're trying to be mindful of all of that. You know, I think probably where we'll land is some sort of um, arrangement where our, our holders, because we want to give people as much control and ownership over the, the characters that they own as possible, mm. um, while also recognizing that like, yeah, if we want to be able to get this in front of as many people as possible, we're going to have to be mindful of what those dynamics look like from an IP and licensing standpoint. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking to lawyers around what the right model is there. It, you know, it'll probably be some sort of process where, you know, maybe we have exclusive rights for certain types of characters that are core to kind of the, the series as an example, but, you know, maybe any of the other characters you can do whatever you want with. Um, it, it's still very much in, in progress and we're kind of doing that out in the open as much as we can. Yeah, I've got a lot of community members here in the chat. So shout out to you guys showing up early uh, in this discussion with Society of the Hourglass uh, with Joe Payne here. So shout out to Hash Rhymes, Chris Causalino, Space Smells Like, Siddle, and Rodolfo, uh, who have kind of commented here in the chat. The rest of you that are here listening, I appreciate you stopping by today. Uh, so for these uh, kind of like narrative plays, right, uh, when you guys are saying bringing Web3 mm -hmm. to Hollywood, what? Like that's a huge vision. It's one that I'm not familiar with because I'm I'm not in the film industry. Really cool yeah. to see different people on the channel that are in these different verticals, right? Film being one of them. What does bringing Web three to Hollywood even even mean essentially to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think even for me, I'm still learning some of that too, right? And I, I have to come on another time and bring one of our jump cut partners on and like because they can really explain the nuance of this, but. If you look at the traditional like top-down studio-led model, the studio kind of controls everything, right? It's like if you want to, if you want us to make this, or if you want to distribute this on our platform, we're calling the shots, we're owning everything, and so you you get these really kind of contentious scenarios. That's why you have all these high-profile like director splits on major motion pictures because they lose control of the vision and they can't make the movie or the series or tell the story that they want to tell. So with, with our approach, we're coming from the bottom up. We're creating this story. We're establishing it. We're, we're building it out with the community. And what we are pitching is a, a fully kind of fleshed out idea that the community and the team owns versus the studio. And so then we have to negotiate what that looks like. Um, but, but essentially the idea is we can either make this, this 
series and then we can talk about what it looks like to distribute it. Do we self-fund and produce it and then distribute it in some way or do we go produce it and sell it to you know a netflix or someone to try and get it made mm -hmm. or, or distributed um, and all of those i think are on the table ultimately it's going to come down to what the community wants to do and how much control they're willing to give up in order to you know expedite or increase the reach that it has mm -hmm. um, but it, it's essentially all about giving the community the power to make decisions that they wouldn't have otherwise been involved in, in that process. Um, so we're, we're trying to kind of open the doors on the writing process and the creative process. And, you know, I, as a community member can make a direct contribution that has an impact on the story that gets told. Whereas before all of that kind of stuff would happen like behind closed doors and it's just studio execs that have this final say in what gets made and what gets approved. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I uh, just recently watched an interview with Andrew Steinwald, who was talking to like a game designer, essentially like a PhD in game design. He was talking about like play to earn economies and all this gaming stuff, right? That's coming mm -hmm. out with NFTs and how now what you essentially have is like a reward feature, like a financial reward feature for yeah. people that are playing games potentially, right? So you're talking about getting involved as a community member in uh what society the hourglass is being built let's say you guys do end up having a really successful animated series is the pitch to the community besides getting involved is the nft going to increase in value i don't i don't like having the increase in value talk but i <laughs> I, I just i think it's a cool concept right like if you build a really cool animated series with a community is there like a revenue split and all these different things that comes along with that? How does that yeah, work? Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's, it's a very fair question. And it's, I mean, I'll, I'll preface anything I say here with like, this is all just speculation. I don't know what the right approach here is. Whatever we do, it will be very intentional and thought through. Like we're not going to rush into saying, oh, we're going to do a revenue share because that's what people want to hear. Like that that's how projects die is when they make promises that they can't keep and we're not going to do that. Um, but conceptually, you know, if, if the series goes really well and it's well received and it takes off and, you know, I, ideally gets renewed for a second, third, 10th season, uh, like, yeah, I, I, I could see the value of those individual NFTs kind of correlating with, with that perceived value on the on the series side and i think again going back to this idea of thinking about this like a web3 brand an entertainment brand the series is just one aspect of that the nft collection is just one aspect of that you know there's there's books there's merchandise like there's all these different potential revenue streams that are feeding value and awareness from the public into what the society of the hourglass is and so if we do this right and we do it well, all of those things kind of elevate the others. Um, and so that's how we're trying to approach this. What the direct monetary output is, I don't know. And, and, I, and I would be oh, lying yeah. if I said I did. Uh, but I, I think our, our goal is to create something that is fun, it's valuable for people, and, and they can be as involved as they want to be. Because we're also going to have people that want to just buy in and hold it and not participate right like we were talking earlier about both attention spans and capacity and time like not everybody can spend hours a day digging into discord or participating in, in some of these processes we want to make it accessible and available but it's not required to get something out of being a part of the community yeah, th so we're not getting a million dollars for every follower is what you're saying. I'm just... <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> we, I think this concept of user-owned media is like such an underdeveloped like concept to even talk about. Like people don't yeah. make the... Like I, I'll give you an example. Like uh, I think it was Arcane or Arcanist or I forgot the name, but it's like a League of Legends. Yeah, Netflix the new Netflix special. show. Yeah. Dude, that first of all, there's no ownership there, of course, but I play with those characters in the game and then I see them in real life. That doesn't happen a lot. You know, that, yeah. that hasn't happened a lot. And you guys are really on the forefront of doing that. Like here's your owner owned NFT that's in right. an animated series. How freaking right. dope is that? Yeah. Well, that, that's the story we always kind of use to equate it to our community is like, what if, what if star Wars had started as an NFT collection and you had minted, Boba Fett or Darth Vader and then you see 
you know, kind of the the cultural mo- like markers that those characters have become. Like now, suddenly owning that NFT means a whole lot more. And, and so that there is a there's a trust component there, right? Because especially for something so core to the story, there, it, you probably are having to have conversations around maybe less ownership of the IP of that character. So you have to really trust that the the team and the, and the brand is going to go and build value in that that you are going to be able to kind of benefit from and again there's a lot to figure out there and i think one of the challenges too is that to your point this all is so new and so early we're having to try and think about these paradigms inside of laws and standards that were conceived well before any of this was even possible and so there's a like square peg and a round hole dynamic with even trying to figure out how to navigate the current landscape that is going to be really, really interesting. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, you're still trying to figure out that kind of Web3 to Hollywood narrative yourself in a, in a sense, right? Like your Jump Cut Media would be a great one to have on next yep. time and things like this so we could have the discussion. But is it going to be years and years, you think, before uh, these big IPs kind of get in? We're seeing a little bit of them, like Disney and we're yep. seeing, uh, let me see, Warner Brothers, a couple others, they're getting involved. Do we see an NFT series from a big corporation uh, here in like the next year or two? Is that something yeah, that's that, on your radar? Th- we're definitely thinking about that. So right now we have a, a really high level timeline kind of laid out with our community. It's about a seven month timeline to go from launch to kind of a decision on how we want to approach getting this made. And so that includes things like getting the handbook written, written, bringing on writers, establishing kind of the first, you know, the pilot episode or the first few episodes, getting things written and developing a full-fledged pitch with a business and a funding model that we, we go make happen. So from there, it, you know, I, I don't know what that tale looks like yet. It could be a year, could be six months. I think a lot of it will too, will depend on the success of the collection itself and how engaged the community gets. The more eager, the community is around bringing this to life, the more attention it's going to garner. And that, that's hard to ignore for someone that's in a position of maybe receiving this pitch and deciding whether or not they want to bring it, bring it on board with their, their platform. Um, so it, it, it's interesting. It's hard to know. Like you, you mentioned the League of Legends um, series. We actually talked about that on our last AMA with Jump Cut. And like that show was in production for six years before it came to life. Um, and, and we're just now talking about it. So yeah. like that, that's not what we're trying to make happen. And I, I think it's also worth noting too, like typically our, our models for how that happens today are reversed, right? Tip, you have this property that gets built up and, and becomes a thing and then it gets turned into a series. We're just kind of like starting there. We don't have years and years of already established you know, media and IP that we're having to navigate and work through. So we're kind of starting with this idea in mind and, um, you know, again, hoping that that's going to help us be more nimble and, and adaptive as we go through this process. Yeah, you mentioned Star Wars as like a great example of, man, if we had NFTs at the beginning of Star Wars, I think that's another really cool rabbit hole that I don't really want to go down, but like all the derivatives <laughs> stories that have come from totally. Star Wars, all like the non-canon, yeah. it makes itself like really cool it's almost open source in a sense yep. for the not it, it really blends well i like that i like that right and, and that's that's the value of this like story handbook that we're building too because you're going to have the same kind of foundational starting point as a hollywood writer that's going and and creating you know a movie or a series from it so you can people can start to create these fan fictions and derivative stories and operate within the same universe as, as the the canon will be and so i think it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun and that's where ownership of all of the generative characters gets really interesting right is because now i can i own this character i can write these stories but i have kind of a fleshed out and vetted foundation to build upon it's not you know a hundred different people telling a hundred different stories with all these different rules and assumptions like no we're all operating from the same playbook here this is a cool rabbit hole and i'm going to stay in it one time further because I'm, I'm just like riff, loving this conversation like if i own <laughs> boba fett a- nft maybe maybe it's a one-of-one uh that you know boba fett story doesn't exist but someone that's a writer really likes that character like i can 
make something out of this, right? Right. Is, do I have the IP control over that? Like, could I shut that down essentially? That, that's that's part of what we're still working through. So there's also a distinction between like the audio and visual rights versus like books, right? And so there's there may even be a distinction there. So maybe I can write stories and books about it, but I can't go make my own series or something. Um, so I, again, the idea is that we want to give our holders as much control over their characters as possible. Um, without creating a scenario that makes this just completely unappealing to anybody on any side of the equation. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I appreciate you hopping down that rabbit hole. Yeah, um, no, it's gonna... fine. I, I could talk about this all day. Yeah. So, so society of the hourglass, again, we talked about that larger umbrella, right? Uh, Hashku. And yeah. one of the utilities of actually buying one of these uh, when that mint goes live on November 3rd, 4th is going to be eventual access to anything that Hashku is launching so take me through like what hashku is and what your guys's plan for that umbrella you know brand uh is yeah uh, january 4th by the oh, way what did i say you said november <laughs> That's well, no, yeah november 2022 in like 50 <laughs> years yeah no d january 4th but yeah so hashku is kind of a homebrewed platform for creators that our, our team has built out uh, so one, one of the challenges that we faced coming into this, if you look at our art, like it's wild how many different character types there are. You know, most, most collections are operating from a single body shape and just layering traits on, on top of it. We have 12 different base types for our generative collection, which means we have to have any, you know, this single trait has to fit all 12 types. And then you multiply that out by the number of traits. Like it's really, really complex. And so as we were thinking through how to create something that could handle that type of generation with all the logic and rules so that we don't have conflicts and layering and things like that, um, it just became clear that like there wasn't anything out there that, that we could use that was going to cut it. And, and again, we're all the entrepreneurs. We build technology. That's what we've been doing for our careers. And so we're like, oh, well, we'll just build it. And as we were doing that, we realized pretty quickly that other people would probably benefit from that too. So the, the kind of the, the idea for Hashku is that it will handle minting and presale registration and art generation and smart contract deployment. So that if, if I'm a, a creator, maybe I have a, an idea for a project, but I don't have the resources or the experience to go, you know, hire a smart contract developer, or know how to get that off the ground. Like this can help me do that. Um, there's a lot of friction on the UX of getting involved in NFTs on any side of the equation, right? Whether you're buying to collect or trying to create. So we're, just, we're trying to simplify that and make the space more accessible across the board. Uh, so if, you know, what would be really cool would be to see a story where, someone hears about nfts they get involved they find our collection they learn about it they go they get in they fall in love with the space they decide they want to launch their own collection and they're able to do that through hashku like that would be a really cool narrative and i i think we'll see that um we're already onboarding other projects into the platform uh, mystic wizards just launched their public mint today they're using hashku our team is helping them with their their stuff um, we've had a couple of other projects and talking to others about using it. And so the, the benefit for holders of the Society of the Hourglass is that the way we're monetizing that right now is through access to presale spots and free NFTs from the collections that are coming on and using it. So we'll be able to funnel all of those back to our holders. So the, the bigger the platform grows and the more projects we have using it, the bigger that community pool of rewards gets and we can find new and, and interesting and more frequent ways of distributing those to, to holders. So what do you foresee uh, that growth looking like for Hashku? I know you just mentioned that Wizards project. I'm not familiar with it, so I'd love to, to get that name one more time. And then what do you see by end of 2022, maybe mid 2022? Do you have like thir three, four, is that success or is it like 10 uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so Mystic Wizards is the name of the, of the, the team. They're a really good group. Um, yeah, for, you know, for success for what Hashku looks like, I, I think ideally we would be onboarding probably a couple collections a month and, um, and, and seeing that just kind of con continually grow. I think as we, 
as we do this and as we learn, we tested it on our Mint Pass collection first. We've got the Mystic Wizards team testing it for us now. We're going to be doing our drop from it again. Like every one of these drops helps make it better. And so it becomes a more and more compelling product as we as we go. Um, so I, I think for me, what would feel really good, regardless of what the number is, is that we have a consistent number uh, and, and volume of projects coming on that are creating a pool big enough for us to feel like our holders have a really good chance of benefiting from that. Because so I get it, a scenario where we have, you know, five NFTs to give to thousands of holders is very different from a scenario where we have dozens or hundreds of NFTs to give to those that same group. And so I, I, I am looking at success more as how it impacts our, our holder group and our community more so than any arbitrary number of users on the platform right now. Gotcha. Okay. So we're about 30 minutes, I would say, into this podcast. It's been a great interview. Uh, shout out to Nick Swervis, who is in the house, Peter Koo, uh, Alfonso as well. Uh, appreciate you guys following along here as we make our way through a conversation with society, the hourglass with Joe Payne. So Joe, before we end the conversation with, you know, the society, the hourglass, do you have anything else uh, that we haven't touched on? I know the book is that digit physical and in that physical book is really important. I think it's a really cool uh, feature there. So if you want to touch on that and then anything else uh, that you might. Yeah. Have. Yeah. The, the book is going to be super fun. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, that was kind of the, the, genesis of our idea for bringing this collection outside of just nfts um, so it's going to be an illustrated seek and find book like where's waldo style um, which is going to be super fun it's going to feature characters from the collection uh, we're gonna we've got 10 different eras ac across the collection like ice age the wild west cyberpunk la so there will be a spread for every era that we have um, and then you can, you know, there's a chance that you'll find your NFT in the book. One of our mint passes also has a, a redeemable feature that lets you pick one of your NFTs to be in the book. So that's going to be another fun dynamic. Um, but yeah, we're going to get a special first edition copy of that book to every every holder. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do a snapshot at some point and, and then anyone holding one will get a copy of that book. Um, we're also going to do a run that we're going to put in the hands of schools and nonprofits. I mentioned education and onboarding being a really big part of this. A lot of us on the team are parents. And you know, as, as I've been working on this, I've been having conversations with my kids about uh, what the Society of the Hourglass is and what are all these cartoon characters that dad's always playing with. And that's turned into conversations about NFTs and what that means and what it looks like. And so... I get really excited every time we have that conversation, thinking about wanting to create those moments for other kids and other people. And um, the other thing too, that's really, really important to us. If you look at the characters, like we have a really diverse set of characters. Like we want the Society of the Hourglass to be a collection and a story that anybody can find a, a character and, and things to identify with and relate to. Um, so that's really, really important to us to get this in as many hands as possible so that people can have those experiences and and just have fun with it. You know, we're, we're again, we're doing this all kind of with our community and discord. We've talked about how the community is going to contribute to the story for the animated series. We're also sourcing ideas for our illustrated book. I mean, if you think about, you know, 10 different spreads at minimum with 300 or so characters on each there are a lot of character interactions happening there and so we're, we're sourcing these like snackable ideas for oh this you know cyberpunk cowboy is staring down a roman centurion in the ice age some little things like that mm. i mean we're gonna just we're gonna riff on those as we start illustrating the book i i, I want to have the uh, nft conversation uh, around uh, what you mentioned with your kids right like i think that's a really cool concept is education yeah. at a super young age like yeah. not indoctrination this isn't a cult although some might think of it as <laughs> so. uh, what do your kids think about nfts like do they understand the concept from a base level or do you feel like that needs to be they need to be a certain age to understand yeah, it, I, I'm kind of feeling that out myself. So I've got a, I, my, I've got a 13 year old, an 11 year old, and an eight year old. So I've got a pretty good spread here, and they're all at different stages of understanding. I, I would say my two oldest get it like surprisingly well. Um, and and I th the way that I think about this is like the next generation is going to grow up 
NFT native in the way that kids today grew, like they don't know life without a smartphone, right? And so the more they're exposed to it at an early age, the better they're going to understand it. Like they're going to be running circles around us when they get to be our age because they've been in the space and exposed to it as consumers and creators for so long. So when I, when I hear my eight-year-old asking like pretty relevant questions about not just the characters, but like the concept behind digital ownership and scarcity. And I, obviously he's not using those words, but like he's, he's hinting at ideas that indicate to me, like he's, he's kind of getting it. And, and, and we've like, we've talked about it, but it's not like I've sat down for hours a day and, you know, unpacked it with him. So it, to me, that gets really, really exciting when I can think about, something that we're creating playing a significant role in the discovery and the education process for kids like really starting to understand that you think about how impactful things like sesame street or the magic school mm -hmm. bus or schoolhouse rock are like you know i i don't know that i can remember any specific thing from a lot of those maybe a few schoolhouse rock videos but I know they were foundational in me learning things and understanding things the way that I do today. And so I, I, that's what I want for the Society of the Hourglass is that, you know, years from now, people talk about how they remember learning or watching or reading Society of the Hourglass stories. For like a half second, I was like, you guys should definitely have that business model where you go into schools and all this. And then I just cut off and I see a video of Senator Warren and the eventual Department of Education head being like, NFTs are terrible for kids. So yeah, it has to happen. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, right? There's still a lot of education to do with the current generation of consumers. And it, yeah, so it, we're looking at that truly, like this is not just for kids. Like we have to be making this accessible and approachable for adults and, and teenagers because they're kind of going to be the first ones coming into the space that have the income to participate in those ways. Gotcha. Okay. So this is the last opportunity here uh, to talk about society of the hourglass. I want to talk a little bit about more about your kind of entrance into the NFT space and like broader market stuff. Uh, I will give this as an opportunity as well. You guys are in the chat. You guys are showing up. You're listening. Come on and participate, man. This is why it's awesome to do these live. Nick Swerve is saying OVOC, which is a play on our OVOT. It's, it used to be our vibe, our tribe. Now it's our vibe, our cult. Uh, or, or <laughs> the awesome. other way around. I'm, I'm kind of joking there, but all right, last bit on, on society of the hourglass uh, and then we'll hop into kind of a broader NFT market discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So launch is January 4th. That's going to be the big day. The absolute best way to learn and get involved is to come in our discord. Um, we're on Twitter at hourglass underscore NFT um, website is societyofthehourglass.com. We've got links to our Discord on both of those places. Um, we've got a, a really fantastic community. Um, it, we've got some really fun puzzles and trivia and stuff coming out. Like we're trying to find ways to make this a lot of fun leading up to and after launch. And then we've got some some pretty big stuff that we're working on that we're not quite ready to talk about yet. That's going to add some compelling dynamics to the collector experience after we drop. So you'll want to be in discord to, to hear about that. We always like getting that, that nice info here on the channel, <laughs> man. So that, yeah, if you can drop anything, you can, but I, I do want to make, make a point as well, guys, uh, you, you, uh, side of the hourglass is working with, you said, Josh Ong, Zeneca as well. Yeah. So, it, you know, we, we've, we've done a Twitter spaces with Josh Ong. Um, we're, we're doing one with Zeneca on Monday. He's been a uh, Zeneca awesome. Um, if anyone has ever interacted with him, just one of the most genuine people in the space. And mm -hmm. he's been, he found us organically really early on. He, he holds a few of our mint passes. Um, and he's just been super supportive and generous with his time kind of behind the scenes. He's not an official advisor, but he's been um, giving us, you know, some feedback and we've done some partnerships with Zen Academy going to be doing the spaces and um, yeah, we've got a bunch of stuff planned over the next month leading up to uh, a metaverse party with, with BitLectro. Um, one, Gabe, one of the BitLectro founders is our advisor and he's been awesome. And so we're going to have a ton of fun and in, in a metaverse party kind of to pre-launch early January. So we'll, we'll be announcing more about that as we shore up those details as well. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, that was Society of the Hourglass. We're going to have ourselves an NFT market discussion for like the next 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, so you mentioned June as your entrance into the crypto and NFT space. 
tell me about that that entrance man like what oh, man. who who the hell got you into this nonsense so it, it, it was early July. It was end of June, early July. Um, I actually got COVID. And so I was quarantined and kind of bedridden. Um, that, thankfully, it wasn't my symptoms weren't bad. I was just quarantined with nothing to do. Um, and and I'm, I'm friends with a few uh, artists that were in the space and I'd seen them tweet about it. And I, I was casually familiar with what NFTs were. Um, you know, I had gotten involved in crypto kind of in 2017 right at the the peak just in time to get wrecked what did you invest in bitcoin um eth a bunch of just crappy stuff that didn't go anywhere i don't even remember that's a period that i try to try not to think about too much Um, thankfully it was it was just play money like it was it was enough to get a bad taste in my mouth but not enough to to hurt too bad but um, you know, so I, anyway, I, as I was kind of locked up with nothing to do, I just spent a little bit of time getting more into NFTs. I, I think one of my buddies had maybe posted a, a picture on Twitter of, of, uh, a dog from the top dog beach club. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. And so I went and checked them out and they, I bought one. I was like, Oh, this is fun. The community's cool. It's a really good team. So I bought another one. Um, and, and I was doing this in Coinbase. Um, I, this, I avoided MetaMask because the UX is terrible, um, but uh, it didn't take super long to realize like, okay, Meta, MetaMask is kind of the de facto standard in this space. Yeah. So in the process of trying to transfer everything, I accidentally burned one of my NFTs um, by sending it back to the contract address. Uh, address. So you were, I have never even done this. So you can buy NFTs through Coinbase's wallet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. They, yep. they, okay. So they, they have cut. Okay. I was, yeah, I was using my wallet address from Coinbase and it was, you, you could That's view awesome. them on the app at the time. Um, I don't, I hadn't looked at the wallet app in a while because I don't use it as much anymore, but um, yeah, I created this scenario where I'm like, oh, it's, it's technology. Like surely that's not a big deal. They can just send it back to me. Uh, turns out that was not the case, but the community, it was, I, I was actually, I'm really grateful that that happened because that was a moment that the community and the founding team, like they, they were really good about helping me understand like what I had done, why I can't get it back. And, you know, they, they, like one of the founders sent me another one to make me whole on that side. And mm-hmm. like, that was just an experience that kind of cauterized for me that like, this space is different. Like people talk a lot about community, but this is one of the first times I've really felt it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was just, there was no going back from there. I just went deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. I, I love this discussion about like your onboarding into NFTs. Like I hadn't heard that concept before we could buy through Coinbase, but I do have a couple questions uh, before we continue with that combo. Yeah, Nick, Swervis, Nick Swervis is saying you guys coming out to Vegas in March, trying to start helping projects set up satellite events during NFT land, which I think that was a combo we were having before the episode. It was. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, right, right now our thinking is that, yeah, we want to be out in Vegas. Uh, Some of our team actually lives out in Vegas. So, um, I I think we're, we're planning on, on having some kind of presence there. Uh, you know, we're, we're still working through to what degree that looks like, but, um, yeah, reach out to me. Um, at Joe Panko on Twitter. Happy to talk. Awesome. Hey dear. Naeem is saying, is the society linked legit? It is legit. I just dropped it again uh, there in the chat. So that is this side of the hourglass. Uh, and then you can go to Discord through that website interface. So, yep. uh, all right. So we're almost at the end here. I have some other lightning questions. So I needed to see like what other NFT projects you hold right now. And then what other ones you're looking at just in the broader space. I know you're super heads down with, with yeah. society of the hourglass, <laughs> but just in general. Yeah. So, uh, Animetas is one that I hold quite a few of. I, I, that was my first experience as a mod in the space. Um, so that was a super fun, um, collection to be a part of the drop and yeah, I'm, I'm still in there and, and, um, love the, the artwork and that team is, is phenomenal. And that one hits on the kind of nostalgia of the eighties and nineties with the pixel art pixel, yeah. anime. It's super fun. Uh, Top Dog Beach Club, I mentioned. Obviously, I'm I'm not in any any blue chips yet. I minted a mutinate, but I, I had sold it a while back. I had a not great experience jumping into that Discord, but it was kind of right at the height of like people trying to figure out are mutants a part of the BAYC or not, and was not super welcomed when I 
did that. So oh, man. mutant mutants all day. <laughs> mutants are. I, I think that's mostly settled out and is normalized. I, I would, you know, hopefully we'll be able to buy back in. But um, yeah, like you said, I'm I'm not necessarily watching anything actively right now. I did get a Thingdom uh, on secondary. That was that you know I think their art's super fun, and I know they. I finally got in the Discord when they when they opened it up and kind of checking out what that's about. Um, Savage Droids is another fun one. Um, if so you're familiar. You're, see, you know some projects. I don't need. Do, oh yeah, that. man. I it, all of these are from like you know the the peak of the summer when I was getting getting really heavily involved. It, I think the if anything, it, it's a really hard time to be building a collection right now. But if there's a good thing, it's that it's kind of forced me to take a step away from trying to actively trade and, and things like that, because this is not a great market for that either. Um, yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm holding what I've got right now and, you know, just focusing on making sure the society, the hourglass is a success. Guys, I'm, I'm leaving the floor open for questions from you uh, that are listening from home. Uh, so hit the chat. If you guys want to ask questions to Joe here, uh, otherwise I'm going to hit you with a couple more uh, just from your Twitter. So I was doing some perusing on your Twitter love the uh i believe the tweet that you retweeted from zeneca which is like focus on lore not floor yeah. i really want to get your take on that because like you spent a little bit of our conversation just talking about lore which i thought was, yeah. was awesome is that something that you like guys are really focused on and you yourself personally i mean for me personally yeah it, it's you know the, the whole like floor conversation hasn't really been a thing in discord um even to the point that like we haven't had to talk about whether that's a thing or not because the the community has just been so focused on what we're building. And, and you know, I think it helps probably that we're, we're pre-launch too. Like I, I'm not naive enough to think that that never becomes a thing. Um, and, and I also recognize like that, that is a part of the space. I think the way that I think about that is it, it's not, are we going to have those conversations or not? It, it's who are we going to optimize for? Um, there will, there are people that want to kind of come in and they want to flip for a quick profit. And that, that's perfectly fine. If our collection is a place that they're able to do that, like, cool. But if it's not like, I don't really care. We're not optimizing for that experience. We're optimizing for the long term. You know, we're, we're thinking in years, not days and weeks. And um, that is not an easy thing to do when you're like sitting here holding something and watching the price go up and down. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we think about this as a brand and the, the work that we're doing is foundational, then it gets a lot easier to not stress about that as much. And I think that's where having things to engage with, excuse me, as a community helps too, is it's like, let, let's not focus on the volatility of the market. Let's focus on building this thing over here together. And ideally we can indirectly affect this thing over here to the point that we all feel really great about it. Um, but in general, like just the whole like stressing over the fluctuations in the floor price is that's, that's a really unhealthy place to be mentally. And, and I found myself there over the summer, right? Like I, I think we'd all be lying if we didn't think about how we were going to be able to flip our way to being multimillionaires in a, in a week with what the summer market was doing. But it, it doesn't take long being in that space to recognize, like, got to got to have a healthier way of engaging with the space. And I think for me, at least, the best way is by not focusing on that short term volatility and zooming out a little bit. You touched on it a little bit here, but I do want to ask the question: What would you change about the NFT space right now? Uh, like, if you if like maybe some features that you just don't think are positive for what's going on there. I mean, there are a few things. I, I love this space and I am all in on it. I I'd, I'd love to see a few things change. Like one is just the nature of how people kind of get hyped about projects. I, I think there's still a lot of unhealthy, like just throwing money at things that aren't going to be here for very long. And that creates these really kind of destructive cycles, both mentally and financially for a lot of people. I, I, you know, I hate seeing people get involved in rug pulls or projects that are maybe started by teams that either don't have any intention of being around or, or don't have the experience to, to know how to be around long-term. Um, you know, I, I would, I would love to see us taking a longer view as a community and being a little bit more thoughtful about 
what gets rewarded in the space. Because as long as the market keeps throwing money at projects like that, they're going to keep showing up. Um, so it, I think collectively we have to think about that and, um, yeah, just create a, a healthier environment where we can be a little more measured in what gets supported and what doesn't. I, I also think, you know, and this is not NFT exclusive necessarily, but just technology in general is still not a super inclusive place for a lot of people. Um, so I, you know, I think, I think we're, we see projects and, and teams trying to do something about that and, and trying to kind of own their responsibility in making this place more inclusive and accessible for people. And, and I, I include us among that, like we have a responsibility to, to do that as well. And we're, we're trying, um, so I would love for this to be a space where people like just anybody can feel like they can come belong and participate. And, you know, whether that's because of who you are or how you identify or who you know, like there's a lot of barriers in the space still um, that, mm. that I think need to break down. Yeah, some of that is UX, but again, some of that is just like an uh, almost like feel uh, or kind of like way that the industry has been for a little while that will change as, as more adoption comes. Uh, to the point on maybe projects that shouldn't be hyped up, I think that comes down to the influencers too. Like even yeah. saying the word influencers feels nasty coming out of my mouth uh like it's it's just at this point where influencers almost seem like they're just pumping projects that they're involved in and then yeah. you know just well, they're involved in or that they are willing to pay them to pump yeah. them right and i you know i don't know if it's a necessary evil or not like I, i'm not one of those guys that thinks you should never pay for marketing or promotion i, I think that's that's naive that like the, the world works like that right now. And, and those are the, the paradigms that exist. But I do think there needs to be a more responsible and transparent way of, of doing that. And, um, yeah, we, influencers obviously are a big player in the space. And um, I, I think you have to be really careful who you associate with and who you kind of attach your, your brand to because, you know, you don't want to be... Um, you know, seen as just another project that's paying for artificial pumps. Like that's not what we're about. That's not what we want. The, at the same time, the awareness is helpful. So we've got to got to navigate that somehow. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. It reminds yeah. me in crypto of the difference between leverage trading and like long-term investing. Like if you're in this space and you're in the NFT space and you attach yourself to a good team, the, the chances that your product is going to increase in value over time are pretty strong just because yep. we're in an industry like that you can get absolutely screwed though if you're trying to chase those leverage plays those plays yeah. that, like are trying to make you rich in a in a day yeah so, yeah it's like time in the market beats timing the market every time right boom there it is i'm clipping <laughs> that one out uh so so nick swervis is saying mutant futtery is dead i i agree with that hey dear naeem is saying how do we get pre-sale access do we just participate in discord yeah, so there are a couple of ways. We, we, our approach to presale access has been like we want to incentivize those who are engaged and participating, but we don't want to make it this exclusive club where you feel like you have to grind for this unhealthy amount of hours to, to get into it. So two ways right now, th three ways, really. One is um, invite three friends to our Discord. Um, and we've got some advice in there around how to do that in a, in a healthy way and not just mindlessly shill and spam. Um, the other way is to level up to level five in, in our Discord through just chatting. We've got some games in there you can play. We've got ways to kind of claim other XP boosts by engaging with us on Twitter. Um, level five is a pretty low threshold. You know, we, we've seen people get there within, you know, not very long at all by just jumping in and being a part of the community. Hmm. Uh, and then, you know, we're also handing them out periodically. If we see someone go out of their way to really help someone or, or do something cool, we'll, we'll just add them to the pre-sale like that. Awesome, man. All right. This has been a great discussion. I, I probably have one more question that's slipping my mind, but in between now and then, I do have like a standard book recommendation question uh, All right. that, that could be crypto, non-crypto. What recommendation do you have out there from a book standpoint? So can it be an audiobook? It could totally be an audiobook. Okay. So I, I'm a big audiobook guy. I'm a huge fan of the Gray Man series. Um, that Netflix is actually making, uh, I think it's a movie uh, based on it. They, they cast Ryan Gosling as the main character, but it's mm -hmm. like a, 
Jason Bourne esque kind of CIA espionage thriller. There's like, I want to say there's 10 plus books in the series. The author's great. The narrator for the audio book is phenomenal and it's the same one for every book. So it's, it's really easy to jump, you know, in and out of these books and not feel like you're listening to another story because the, the narrator changed. Um, so they're, they're a good time. So you said gray man series. Is that what the gray man like? series? Okay. Yeah. All right. I actually be uh, giving that a go. You, you pitched me pretty hard on that. I'm yeah. You should, you should check it out. It's definitely worth, worth, worth reading or listening to. Awesome, man. All right. Well, this is going to be worth listening to afterwards. If you came in right at the end, we're seeing some, some people flood in kind of right here as the episode is getting over with, but appreciate all of you guys that were with us, guys and gals that were with us throughout the entire uh, interview. This is the society of the hourglass. This is co-founder Joe Payne. Joe, you did a fantastic job, man. Uh, we will definitely Appreciate have it. you on again. Again, Mint, yeah. Mint is on January 4th, not November January 4th. 4th. January 4th. Although that would be on brand, like Society of the Hourglass, time travel. We could go back to <laughs> November 4th and do the yeah. Mint. We, I mean, we, we did have an original Mint Day slated for November. Uh, we, we delayed the collection because we, we felt like the we weren't ready and the market wasn't ready. So yeah. we, we can find a way to tell that story somehow, maybe. Awesome, man. Add that to the lore. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Yeah. We will head out. Uh, this was the Nifty Q show. I will be back next week uh, with a bunch of different interviews. But again, Society of the Hourglass, Joe, thanks for coming on today. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. Had a blast.